welcome everyone. Good morning. Thank you so much for taking a little bit of your time this morning to join us uh, at the Tennessee Small Business Development Center for this awesome webinar, Taking the Retail Experience Online. We're very excited to bring this uh, webinar to you in partnership with the City of Memphis Office of Business Diversity and Compliance. And again, we have the wonderful Miss Adrian McFarland here ready to impart a ton of knowledge to us. So uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to you, Adrian, and you can take off here. Good morning, everyone. I was, we were just talking, if you're, if you're just getting on the webinar about adding some Michael Jackson to the next webinar so we can all loosen up since it's so early. But let me share my screen so that we can get started. All right. So good morning, everyone. Hi, I am Adrian McFarland. I am a Shopify Empower Coach, and I am here to empower you to start or scale your business using the Shopify platform. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, I like to run a fun and open webinar. So anytime that you have questions, please leave them in the chat. Don't be afraid to ask questions. That's what I'm here for. And uh, I hope this information is valuable to you today. So we're going to jump right in because I have a lot to cover. So taking the retail experience online with Shopify. So what is Shopify? Shopify, if you're not aware, is a cloud-based multi-channel commerce platform designed to help you run your business. Shopify allows you to design, set up, and manage your stores across multiple sales channels, including the web, your mobile phone, social media, marketplaces, brick and mortar locations, and pop-up shops. Shopify is much more than a simple website or an online checkout. Like I mentioned previously, you have the ability to sell in an online store, your social media, your online marketplaces, and your retail pop-ups all in one platform. You also have the ability to market your business your, via your email campaigns, your social media campaigns, messaging, as well as a shop app. And you can manage your store's inventory, your customers, your staff, your payments, and your shipping. And then you also can use your, you'll see your analytics, which I love. Shopify has great analytic reports for you to measure your business's success. And uh, you can do that all through the platform as well. But most importantly, you also have the ability to grow your business with Shopify by they offer 24 seven support, uh, Shopify capital as you scale your business. And they also have a Shopify fulfillment network. And we'll talk about all of these things throughout this webinar. So running a business means staying on top of lots of moving parts and Shopify makes that easy for merchants to provide one mission control for your business. So you can keep track of all of the components of your business from processing your orders to your shipping, like I mentioned before, and that's what makes it so easy. Uh, my husband and I, we like to build Shopify stores for fun just because they're so easy to build. So there are a couple of things we'll be covering today, starting with what is happening in e-commerce, followed by best practices for designing your Shopify store and what you should be paying attention to to uh, attract the most customers and keep them. And then why the homepage is important for navigation and creating collections that will highlight your products. So what's happening in e-commerce today? As the industry has changed to meet the demand of increased online shoppers, there has also been an increase in merchants. Some are full-time e-commerce business entre entrepreneurs, as well as part-time entrepreneurs who are looking to start a side hustle in order to bring in some extra cash. Of course, these things take time and a minimal financial investment, but if done right, it can be quite rewarding. So why start an e-commerce business or Shopify store for that matter? Well, some people like to test the business landscape. You may be unsure of how the process works or you need to test your product. So it's a low risk way to start a business when you open up an e-commerce store. You don't have to come up with too much capital. And however, it is also a way to add some additional income to your salary that doesn't require as much time. And when I say as much time, I mean, 
as if like you had to commute every day to work, work a nine to five. However, in order for your Shopify store to be successful, it does require some time. Um, you may have to use your schedule out your weekends in order to respond to customers, take out shipments, process shipping orders, um, and even update your website. So just keep those things in mind when you're starting your Shopify store. So there are a couple of different options that you could do in order to start a Shopify store part-time. Um, and, and then it could also scale into a full-time business, but these are a couple that you could use, uh, implement that would not take so much time. So first you have a print on demand store and it involves working with a supplier to customize products like tote bags and t-shirts with your own designs. You also have drop shipping, which is a fulfillment method where you don't keep any products you sell in stock. Instead, you purchase the items from the supplier after the order is placed and the supplier ships it to your customer. We'll talk a little bit more about drop shipping today too. Um, freelance work, you can have a freelance website with Shopify means, and it means you work with different companies in order to provide different uh, services at different times rather than being employed by just one. So for instance, if you're a photographer or if you're a marketer, you would like to do your photography business on the side, you could use this as a freelance platform. Um, it's a popular idea um, for businesses and, it, and people that are going into business because it doesn't take any money to start it and you only need a skill to sell. So to think about freelance if you have that. Um, live streaming, I'm pretty sure you guys have saw a lot of people going into this industry. Streaming is becoming a popular way to entertain people. A professional streamer is someone who makes money from live broadcasting games, music, art, live content, and more. So I know a couple of years ago, people were starting to do live streaming with video games. And so it kind of uh, playing the video games. If you have kids, you probably see your kids watching YouTube videos with live streamers all the time. But now it's becoming more mainstream where you see people streaming even workout classes. And this has elevated to its highest capacity during the pandemic. We've all reached, uh, witnessed that. Um, but you also have uh, affiliate marketing. And if you haven't heard of affiliate marketing, it refers to earning a commission by promoting a product or service made by another company. So it's a business model where you, the affiliate partner, earns money for providing a specific result to the company or the advertiser. And that result could be a sale, oh. payouts for your leads, clicks, downloads of a specific product, um, or any other business out outcome that you and the partnership can uh, come up with. And then a last popular one that we have saw a lot is making and selling crafts. So anyone can make and sell crafts from home today. Plus working with your hands is good for your brain. So experts, uh, they have found that using your hands on a task that doesn't take much thinking gives your brain a chance to relax and rest. We all need that, right? So it's also uh, can give you a sense of accomplishment and reduce stress and anxiety. Think of it as a meditative practice. But one thing that turns, uh, it's one thing that turns a profit later down the line, like creating jewelry, candles, ceramics. I've been seeing a lot of trends in the candle uh, creation lately. Uh, you see this with uh, selling children's uh, tutus. I bought a dress like this. And your first thought for that may be to sell these crafts on sites like Etsy or eBay, which is also fine. And it's not a bad idea. Um, yet you could build a website and start your own business online under your own brand. And it'll save you a ton of money in commission fees. So when you are, definitely you still use the other platforms if you are if you have already started doing this. But if you have saw a, a specific uh, growth in your products and you can, um, you, you can come up with a brand name and you feel like you can scale your business to that next level, definitely think about straying a little away from the commission-based platforms and starting a Shopify store to sell your own personal crafts. It can be very profitable if you are, if you do not sell, uh, if you sell off, off of a platform that takes a commission. So just think about how you can do that. 
So let's take a closer look into the drop shipping model. To get started with a little experience, there's a supplier, there's supplier apps located in the Shopify app store that will allow you to integrate and get started immediately with sourcing products and adding them to your store to sell. So as you see to the left of the screen, I've listed a couple of them, but I'm going to touch on Oberlo because it's one of the first that it was uh, put out there by Shopify. So um, Oberlo is a drop shipping app that lets you source products from AliExpress suppliers. Now you can also just do this from AliExpress on its own, but Oberlo asks as an integration site. So you can download that app strictly from the uh, app store. With our Burlo, you can import your products to your Shopify store, edit the product listing, and place orders individually or in bulk. After you make a sale in your Shopify store, you purchase the products from a supplier that you have found on AliExpress, and then they ship them directly to your customer. You do not need to store a package or ship your products, and this means you focus on adding products to your online store making sales and placing orders without managing or investing in inventory. So I want to highlight there uh, without, you know, of course, you're not keeping the inventory in home. They're going to ship it for you. When you're sourcing these products, be sure that you take a look at the shipping time and there's multiple types of shipping. The, the quickest one is e-packet. So if they do offer that, you may want to ship e-packet, uh, but also you want to make sure that you source the correct product and take a look at the profit margins because you have to remember they're taking all of the risk of shipping the product for you so and handling and everything. So you're going to take a lot less profit. But if you find a great product that you can source when you drop ship, it can be very profitable and have, so, and have a less startup cost for you. So just think about your products and your shipping you know, your pricing, your shipping, because you could come out where you're, if you don't pick the right products, where you're paying money to get this to your customer and you don't want to do that, right? So some of the most common startup costs with starting a Shopify store using the drop shipping model are the cost of your domain, the cost of your Shopify monthly subscription, your marketing dollars to test your products. Let me stop here. Your marketing dollars to test your products Yes, you're not putting in money to uh, ship and to purchase the inventory. However, I like to tell people, remember your website can sit in a black hole. No one will see it if you do not budget for marketing, whether that's organic marketing, whether that's paid marketing. And if your website falls into a black hole without putting marketing dollars out there, you're going to be expecting you know, a profit and it's going to be a loss because you're paying for your monthly subscription. You may be paying for an app that you had to integrate. So think about those profit margins when you're, again, sourcing your product. So some of those marketing um, apps, though, that you may want to integrate are your email marketing subscriptions. Email marketing is very important now. So you may want to source some, um, think about starting an email campaign, whether that's through MailChimp, whether that's through Constant Contacts. Uh, Shopify has some great integrations that are already there. So think about your email marketing. If you use a paid supplier app, you'll need to add that to your budget as well. And think about um, that all businesses and entrepreneurs are, are different, but it's possible that you can generate an income of $1,000 to $2,000 per month after a year of working on your store, approximately 10 to 15 hours per week. So while it may seem challenging at first, this passive income idea can earn you residual income and eventually a full-time salary when done correctly. So are you a great graphic designer? Have a great idea for a new brand or you know exactly what people like on their t-shirts? Then a print-on-demand store may be right for you. What started as a model to help print t-shirts faster for business owners has now grown into a multi-product integration from t-shirts to hats and even mugs. The supplier sells them to you on a per order basis with your brand. In other words, <clears throat> excuse me, in other words, you don't pay for any products until you've sold them. 
The company also fulfills and ships your customers' orders. Print on demand makes a great part-time business idea because it takes little to no investment. You don't hold any inventory. You don't have to spend money on materials or equipment. You just need to choose a print on demand company to work with, create your design, then upload them to your Shopify store app. Some of those apps are Printify, Gelato, and Printful, and they're all located in the Shopify app store. The biggest investment you'll make it's, is time for creating your design and building your online brand with your marketing. Popular print-on-demand product business, products business sale include your t-shirts, your books, bags, wall art, phone cases, mugs, and socks. So if you have a great idea for a brand or you know about the great trends and sayings and t-shirts, this may be a business for you. Now, let's talk about website fundamentals. After you have decided what business you would like to start, it's time to take these fundamentals into consideration when designing your store. Picking the right theme that speaks to your user experience and product, establishing trust with your customers based on that design, and making sure that the fundamentals of the store, such as a return policy, are in place. So let's discuss the Shopify theme store. You can get lost in this theme store, by the way, because it's so many themes and you'll be checking them all out, and especially on your first site and trying to see what works best for you. It's really great. Um, there are over 100 themes available for your Shopify store. They can be sorted by the type of collection that you have, the industry that you are in going into, as well as the size of your store as it relates to the amounts of products that you will be selling. So some people, as you know, started, let's say, take something that was popular years ago, like the fidget spinner. The fidget spinner was a one product store. So there's different things that you can sell on a multitude where like if you sell makeup, you may be selling uh, hundreds of different types of products but if you're selling uh you know like toms which is one type of shoe and now they've scaled it will be a one product store um there are a couple of free themes available that are fully functional so if you have to start with a free theme that's totally fine to get you started but there are also paid themes such as the one you see here that offer more functionality and versatility like quick buy recommended products and high resolution resolution photos. So just depending on what level of uh, that you are in your business and where you think you're going to take your business over a short period of time, maybe what you want to decide when choosing your theme. So if you're just starting out and you want to sell candles, it's totally fine with just starting out with a free theme. You just need to make sure all of the components for running your, your e-commerce store are in place and then scale from there. Um, all of the themes in the Shopify store come with a built-in editor. So meaning you can edit your theme um, for what you like and what works and it will look, um, it works like this. So let me tell you a little bit about that. You will add a new page to your store and it automatically uses your theme's default page template. So as you add, the, the theme to your store, it automatically populates. You have to change some things around, of course, upload your logo on the back end, but it will automatically populate as you edit. So if you want something a bit different from what you are offered, you simply choose another page template within that theme. If you want a different overall look for your store, you can choose a new theme from shop the Shopify theme store. And that theme will have its own set of templates and you can add the new content for each page without having to edit the code base. So that's what makes Shopify so easy now. Now, if you're used to, if you're the MySpace generation like myself, you are probably used to doing a little HTML, which is totally fine, but there is absolutely no coding required. You do not need to know anything uh, about codes in order to make your Shopify store functional. Since there is no messing with code, you will see few, or, or if any at all, disruptions from your store. So you won't see 
uh, and it happens, I've had it happen to me where you'll have, you know, some, an error on the store as you design, which is totally fine. All of the themes come with their contact information for who built them from the developer side, and they're really response, uh, responsive. However, let me say this, read the reviews about the theme store. You can see different people that have had Shopify stores using those particular themes in the app, in the theme store. So read the reviews about the app. And one thing to look for is to make sure the developers are responsive, responsive to questions. So I haven't ran into any issues with any developers, but definitely read the reviews on your particular theme. It not only can help you answer questions, but it can also help you decide if the industry that you're going into uh, works well with that particular theme, just based off of the review. So check those out. So building a trustworthy website and brand comes with work. However, there are things you can put into place that will ease your customer's purchase anxiety by establish a, establishing a place to include contact information. And you will need this here, not only to ensure customer shipping is correct, but to also offer a personal shopping experience in your marketing plans, especially for your returning customers and your new customers as well, but your returning customers. Uh, using this in information in a customized email campaign is can be very beneficial for having someone return to your store and purchase again, or if they abandon the cart, or even having that data you can implement other marketing strategies like direct mail. So just thinking about how you wanna scale your business, also think about establishing trust so that people will want to leave their contact information. Uh, make sure that your return policy uh, is in a visible place for customers to find. Uh, you don't want them to be unsure and you have it hidden in places. So I would suggest adding it into the header, into the footer, as well as your checkout page. That way people can review it as they check out or as needed. Because if, of course, if they can't see your return policy and you don't offer returns, that's gonna open up a can of worms and you don't want that. And that, that if you have a product that can be purchased more than once, you have already put a stump in your returning customer. So in your retention plan. So think about that. Um, your Shopify payment method is also important. Shopify makes it easy for customers to check out. So your store can include your PayPal links, ShopPay, as well as a Google checkout. Um, Shopify also has an in-store system that reviews the trustworthiness of someone's credit card information. And although this is an option, it is still a must for you to review all of your customers' payment uh, transactions. You don't want to have any fraud. So be sure to check that every time you get an order, especially if you're running a small business, it will prompt you and tell you if the credit card has any type of, uh, if it's trustworthy. However, check that information because fraud can limit your trust. We also want to make sure that we have a visual appealing store. And it's one of the first things that potential customers will see when visiting your store. So remember, think of your online store the same way you see an in-person brick and mortar location. You want your site to be inviting, clean, and all of the products to be visible and clear for the customer's understanding. So you, have you ever walked in a store and everything has been all over the place? is the same thing with your website. You wanna make sure that everything is visually appealing, include, including, especially if you're including multiple types of products. So um, making sure that the labels are there, making sure that the colors flow. And you can uh, do this by having some great photography. So taking pictures that are clear, that uh, look professional is gonna be essential to establishing trust. Your color scheme should um, is also a fundamental when designing your Shopify store. You may want to consult with the designer. However, thinking of what color palette you want to use can be found on various graphic design websites such as Canva as well as Adobe. So don't pick a theme based on colors or fonts. Those are the, that person's colors and fonts. These are all things you can customize later. 
You can even make your theme truly unique by hiring a Shopify expert to customize it for you. And you can also use platforms like Fiverr or uh, platforms like Upwork to find Shopify experts to build your website for you. But if you want to take the challenge and do it yourself, just remember your color scheme and uh, you can do it. So remember certain color triggers uh, emotions. So first you want, uh, you need to get a good understanding of what you're selling and what you're providing. And if you're trying to achieve a more premium high-end image, that research shows that purple is your go-to as people associate it with royalty, high quality, and it's intriguing. However, if you're looking to reach a broader audience, Blue is a reassuring, gentle color that fits well for more delicate subjects like healthcare or financials. Uh, choose a primary color first. So the best way to decide on a primary color is to think about the vibe of your product or service and peruse those colors that fit that vibe to find one you like. So uh, you want that one and then you, you, you want your primary color and then you wanna transition into your additional colors. A good starting point here is to consider color components. Every color has a counterpart that makes it pop, and these are known as color complements. So this is an important choice as the background of your website is theoretically going to take up more space than any other color. However, it's an easy choice to make since it really boils down to two options. You can go for a more muted version of your primary color in order to solidify your branding. And, or this, and, and this will require a white or gray overlay on the background in order for the text to show up. Alternatively, you could just have the whole website be an off-white color, which is the more common choice. It's inoffensive and it won't stop anything. Text, images, or links from jumping off the page. And then finally, your text color. You might go for the easy choice, which is black, but have a browse around the internet. It's more color out there. You can see some really dark grays, maybe even some blues. So communication is always key in business. Let's not forget our About Us pages that are now very important. People are more likely to buy into social brands that speak to particular communities or social causes or social causes. And buyers are also searching for relatable smaller businesses where they can understand who received, where, and how their money is being spent. So I'm one of those people. A lot of people are wanting to know well while they support the small business, they want to know who runs a small business, what they care about. So you will see a lot of social um, issues in the forefront of brands now. Whereas, and, and one of the, I, I mentioned Tom's, but they're doing a really good, they did a really good job as, of leading the way with that, of saying that these shoes are, are the funding from these shoes are, are supporting a particular cause. So you may want to also think about that or really just showing a little bit inside of who you are. I see that a lot with mom, uh, mom brands that sell baby products they often show the lifestyle of, um, of them with their children. So, and people buy into it because they can know exactly where their money is being spent and how it's helping a small family. So remember to have uh, your contact us page visible as well. Customers may have questions before and after or even none related to the purchasing experience that they may uh, want to ask. So make sure that they can always contact you. If you choose to uh, not have a phone number readily available, be sure to have customers uh, have a clear way that they can trust their questions will be answered. Adding an in-store chat is one of the best ways to do this. You can customize your chat for certain hours and offer this feature through multiple channels like Facebook. I personally love automated answers that you can pre-select for frequently asked questions such as hours of operation, or your shopping time. Remember your e-commerce business can make money overnight. So you may have someone, and you can sell internationally. So you may have someone that has a question in a different time zone than you are, but you technically may be sleeping at the time. The question could be easy 
you want to make sure that you have your frequently asked questions um, already integrated into your your chat because they can answer them. And then in the morning, if it's even deeper than that, you'll have an option to go back and email them or contact them about the question or even call them about the question that they had if that's an option for them to leave their phone number. So let's talk about your store policies. Uh, your store policy is another great way to offer trust to customers. Make sure, as I previously mentioned, your return policy should be visible and clear. And if you offer a no return policy, you may wanna communicate that in multiple places on the site to prevent customers from expecting a different response if an item they bought was incorrect. However, it is, a, it is great to honor customers' requests for packages arriving damaged or incorrect from your daily business operations, like sending the wrong product. Maybe even offer a store credit for customers or personalized discounts. If you offer multiple ways to pick up like curbside, which has been very popular during the pandemic, make sure that options are available and visible, but remember you must have your steps in place to be sure the customer has a seamless experience because you don't want that to lead to a bad review. Repeat customers is critical, and if done correctly, this can be essential for customer reviews, which can lead to great search engine optimization and customer trust. FAQs can save time for you and the customers. Think of some things that may spark a question from your customer, like allergies for food, like food allergies, what your products are made of, uh, what you, anything of what you use it to create is really great because people have all types of issues that they uh, may not be able to actually buy your product and it can avoid you a very um, sticky situation later. A uh, great way to do this is to check to see what your competition has created and tailor your messaging to fit your business. So if you have a, if you're selling rugs and you want to see what their shipping policy is or what their return policy is for the rugs, you may want to check your custom, your their FAQs because They'll, if they're a business that has been around for a while, they have experienced these situations and you can basically take what they're doing and say, I'm going to implement my own policy that works best for my business and, um, and you can save a lot of time for your customers. So remember that with your FAQs and really anything, your shipping policy, your return policy, all of your policies, check a look, take a look at your competition, see what they're doing, especially if they've been in business for a long time. And some of those crossroads that they have, that you may experience can be avoided if you have researched and saw what they're doing and put it in policy uh, for you to get ahead of it. So think about that. Uh, let's talk a little bit about navigation, which is also a fundamental when designing your website. The navigational strength of a web page rests on its simplicity. This may seem contradictory when you want to accommodate different types of visitors, but it makes sense when you consider how quickly people move from page to page on the internet. Header navigation should be as straightforward as possible, prioritizing the paths that matter most to most visitors. So again, those analytics that you're gonna receive um, are really are gonna be really important to see how long people are staying on your site. So let's take for an example, if they're coming on there, you see the time that they're spending on the site and it's less than 15 seconds, you know then that there are not, something's going on on the site where they're not scrolling through your products, reading about you. They're not doing any of that. There's websites like um, hot jar they can record what the user experience looks like and for you and then you can review all of a, a couple of those depending on the plan that you that you sign up for and that's hot jar um, depending on that plan you can see the user experience and maybe make some changes because they may be getting lost so think about that sites with too many navigation options can feel very cluttered and overwhelming increasing the likeliness that the visitors will drop off or take the wrong path. And you don't want them to be coming on there looking for cookies and they can't find the type of cookies that they're looking for because it's confusing because I don't know which tab to, to go to to get that. So thinking about that journey is gonna be very helpful to keeping customers from dropping off from your website. A good practice is to prioritize your navigation links from left to right. 
with the most important pages to the left. And I think my, my husband and I were designers. We talked about this. We think it's from, uh, if you have noticed, research has showed, shown that people like to put their, left, their logos on the left-hand side. Well, you also type from left to right in the search bar. So the, the user is used to looking on your left-hand corner. So just remember that when you're prioritizing your navigation. If you have a lot of products and collections, focus on your main top level collections in your homepage, Nav in your homepage navigation and use a mega menu or drop down menu to create sub navigation. Now you can only do this with certain themes. Certain themes will not allow you to have a mega menu or drop down menu. So if that's something that you are going to need in order to sell your products, like we talked, spoke about themes earlier, research the theme that you're going to use, know what you're selling so that you can make sure that you have all the functionality that you need to run your business. Sub navigation is an excellent way to organize your products and pages for easy exploration without overwhelming customers with too many options from the get go. Some websites also have links to their about us page, contact us page, FAQ pages, or other pages in their header navigation because they support their, they support their primary goals. Especially if you are a, are a social brand, you're going to want that about us page in your header, or you may want your story in your header. If not, and you're product based and you're kind of in the back of the, the back of the seat of the brand, you may have it in the top left corner or even just in the footer. But if you find that visitors to the, these pages aren't converting according to your goals, it's likely that these links are taking them off the path to conversion. So if this is the case, it's best to add these links to the footer in, instead. Links are gonna be very important. Navigation is gonna be very important, especially if you are marketing on social media. So you wanna make sure all of your links are in place correctly because if you run an ad on Facebook and the ad is telling your customer to go one place, there you already have them motivated to buy because they click that ad and then they get to their page and they lose the motivation because they're sent somewhere that's like to an email address. And you're like, oh, I wasn't trying to get them. I wasn't trying to take a, give you my email address. I wanted to buy your product. You create that funnel. They were there to buy, they were motivated to buy the product. You want them to buy the product and maybe in the checkout, you're gonna gain all of their information. So think about your customer journey of what they're gonna do from the time you give them something in a call to action to the time they add to cart. And if they add to cart and they don't buy, you're gonna even have a place of navigation there that's going to bring them back to your store in order to purchase. Let's talk about your home page. Your home page serves as both an introduction to your brand and a set of coded instructions meant to help both new and existing customers navigate your business to find what they need. Much like a landing page, every detail should build toward making a strong first impression and encouraging an intended action. Whether the goal of your home page is to sell your products or capture email subscribers. There's no one way to design a homepage. However, there are some things to keep in mind as you plan your homepage from top to bottom, whether you're building your first store or revisiting this crucial part of your website. Visitors sometimes land on home pages knowing what they want, and other times they may not. So you have to design your homepage with both in mind while ensuring their decisions align with your primary goals. A direct call to action is, uh, a direct call to action is something to think of, uh, well, think of it, a call of action is an exit sign on like a highway and it should be uh, short, it should be hard to miss and it should point the, the drivers down a path they need to, the path they need to take. So. Think of it as, hey, I want you to do this. I'm coming to you instantly and you should go this way. Um, that's how you're gonna think of your customer journey. Your call to action and what they, what they link to should align with your customer's next steps. 
they can take toward the main goals of your homepage. That might mean linking to your latest collection or getting users to watch an explainer video to learn more. Your search bar, many uh, that's at the top of the page, you wanna add that. Many on online stores include this search bar to help visitors who know exactly what they are looking for, especially if they have many different products or lots of content to explore. And they may be a repeat visitor and they have come to your, they may have lost and didn't know what they were looking, how to find what you were looking for, but they know it's on there. They don't want to go through the hassle of the, the menu. So they go straight to your search bar, type in the type of cookies that you sell and they, they're ready to purchase. So make sure that you have that in the theme that you choose has that. Uh, you want a easy shopping cart. So make it clear to customers when items are in their cart and how to access it. Uh, there are some of the things that should be visible on your homepage and easy for customers to find. Think of factors like user demographics, your branding, your number of products, your marketing channels, and more that can influence your user's behavior in a medley of ways. That's why it's so important to always view your homepage as a work in progress using the traffic and sales you generate to measure the impact of your homepage and make adjustments over time. So once you get started, like I mentioned before, check your analytics, see what your traffic is, visit, revisit your analytics, uh, revisit your webpage and make adjustments. It's totally fine, especially your homepage, as you test products to make changes. And then you also wanna give repeat customers something fresh to look at every now and then. So change it up in your, uh, in your slideshow, change it up always write different blogs, come up with different collections, maybe something based off the season. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So your domain name, what are they? Where can you buy one? A domain name or your URL is your website's address. You can customize your domain name to your store and domain names can end in .com, which is the most popular, .org, .gov, and even more creative things now like .co or .io. It's important to choose a domain name that's easy to remember and spell so customers can find you. Easy to remember and can spell. You can buy, buy a from you can buy these from Google domains, GoDaddy, but you can also purchase your domain directly through your Shopify platform. When you buy a domain name through Shopify, the configuration and setup are completely automated and you can also use email forwarding, manage subdomains and add international domains. Domain, meaning you can have more than one. Domains help you to establish your brand. A domain name gives your business credibility and tells customers you're here to stay. Rank higher, you're gonna two, you're gonna rank higher in search. You're gonna, having a domain name related to your industry can help you rank higher for similar keywords. So if you're selling, um, if you're selling makeup, if and you put beauty inside of your domain name, of course it's gonna be a keyword that relates to that industry. So thinking about that can help you as well in search engine optimization. Uh, it's going to a great domain name is going to stay top of mind and if it's unique the domain name makes it easier for customers to remember you and find your business later and if possible choose a domain name that includes your brand or company name ideally you'd go with yourstore.com whatever your store is.com but that's not always an option if someone else has already claimed the domain in that case, you might want to try using a different TLD, which is like .org or .net, or getting creative with your .com domain name, but you can definitely um, just keep in mind to keep that very simple for your, for your customers. Uh, you can move your, your website to a different domain if you want to change your URL. And when you move your website to a different domain, it is important though, to follow the search engine optimization best practices to minimize loss of traffic. So you may have already started your, your website and you may want to be, you may want to switch from one platform over to Shopify. Just make sure that you follow search engine optimization best practices. That means implementing the keywords that you have already used 
or your previous website into your Shopify website, making sure that your content aligns, those things are going to be critical to make sure you don't lose that traffic if you're going to change a domain name. By redirecting the old domain to the new live domain, you can signal Google uh, that the new domain is the home of the old domain's content. So just remember that when switching domains. You may want to add both, though. Um, remember, uh, another thing to remember are your product photos. Whether you're promoting a product or collection or trying to capture leads, the purpose of your visuals is to draw in the user's attention immediately as they arrive on your website. Clean product photography helps you put your best foot forward. If you're on a budget, you can shoot your own product photos, even with just a smartphone camera, or use free stock photos until you can shoot your own custom lifestyle photos. I'm not a fan of using uh, for, for your actual products. I'm not a fan of using stock. So if you sell um, a certain product that you can find on Adobe stock, I suggest that you still shoot a product photo. If you drop ship, it's gonna come with product photos. And it's totally okay also to use stock photos around the website before the actual customer to view what they're going to get you should shoot your own product photos unless you're drop shipping and those are actual photos but shoot your own product photos guys you can do this with your phone so you can take your own photos by first using a room with good lighting find the room in your home with a well-lit window the bigger the window the more natural light you will have for bringing your product to life choose your smartphone most smartphone cameras today have the uh, DSLR alternatives for product photography that you use when you're having an actual camera. So uh, remember that the higher megapixel count, the better your product photos will come out. You can also purchase mini tripods, which you see a lot of influencers doing today, but mini tripod can range from inexpensive to pricey. But the good news is no matter your budget, they're a good investment to have and it'll pay off. The mini tripod will reduce the camera shake and help standardize photo angles and style for your product line. Set up your backdrop place, set up your backdrop by placing your white background behind your product to give your photographs a clean and consistent look and to eliminate distractions. And remember to get plenty of angles and you can do this with a tripod and you can do it on your own, but a tripod will give you a clear, clean cut a photo and then use a whiteboard if you need more light or a diffuser if you have to lessen the light either way you can use an iphone 8 or a galaxy 8 or higher and both of them will do the trick so those phones will definitely you can take great photo and video so also fundamental, very important fundamental, as we know the web right now has so many websites, e-commerce is growing every day. It has grown tremendously through the pandemic. So e-commerce copywriting is gonna be very important. This refers to any text or written content you create for an online store, meaning your headlines, your category pages, your product descriptions, your promo offers, and your landing pages all need to have great copywriting. These are all places where your writing skills can help bring in more sales. The goal of e-commerce copywriting is to clearly explain the benefits of your products while also helping your online store rank better on search engines. That's, that's what we call SEO. To be successful, you have to be a strong communicator, persuasive with words, promote the voice of your brand, and understand the psychology of what makes a customer purchase. On landing pages, the simpler your e-commerce copywriting is, the better chance you'll have of converting. Simply try to use fewer words in each sentence and fewer syllables in each word. The difficulty of the text should land somewhere between very easy and standard. So you don't have to go in there having big words to make your product sound like they're better. The simpler, the better. Our product pages are some of the most important pages of your online store. 
These are where customers get to learn more about a specific product they're interested in, and you get the chance to sell them on why they need it. It's often the last page customers see before they go to checkout. So you want to give them every reason to follow through with the order, meaning don't leave anything about the product out. If it's made out of polyester, say it's made out of polyester. You don't want any surprises, so you cannot have as many returns or lessen the expectations of your customer about your brand. This means there should be so much more than a two sentence product description and a list of features. Start by writing about the unique selling proposition that your customers care about most. So if that's comfy, you have comfy shoes, make sure that's communicated. And then focus on the benefits your products provides. Oh, I can wear these comfy shoes for eight hours, 12 hours standing on my feet. Those details will help in selling your products. Look for different ways you can tell a story about your products. Maybe these shoes came from your own experience. I was a nurse. I had to wear these shoes for 12 hours a day. I am a witness that these shoes are comfy. And highlight some of the reasons why customers recommend it. So maybe if you haven't had reviews or you have had reviews, they recommend this because they, maybe they already have something going on with their feet. This is just an example of a shoe, if you're selling a shoe like this. Um, maybe their feet are cold and they offer warmth. You just, whatever your, your product does for the customer, communicate that. One of the most common mistakes when copywriting are words soup and fluff words. It's the stuff that doesn't really add anything to the value of the product. So just getting on there, writing just anything and really just to fill in a blank is not good either. Make sure that you are clear about what the product does and, and, that'll, and that'll help. You don't have to make up stuff. Um, it's a problem because today online readers already have a low attention span. So if you try to fill the page with content that doesn't really mean anything, they're probably going to click away anyway. So just remember that the copyright should probably make them want to read more. So also creating collections. You can group your products into collections to make it easier for customers to find them by category. An automated collection uses selection conditions to automatically include matching products. You can add up to 60 selection conditions per product, and you can also specify whether products need to meet all of the conditions or any of the conditions to be included in the collection. When you add a new product, that matches the selection conditions for a collection, the product is automatically added to the collection. So in short form, if you have a particular product and you want it to, and you upload different things all the time, you can set conditions, like let's say it's summer, it's a summer collection and the description has keywords in there that speak directly to uh, the summertime those products that you upload will automatically be added to that particular collection. That's a simpler way to put it. With the manual collection um, option, though that's where you can choose products individually that need to go into a particular collection. So let's say you're doing something for charity and only a certain amount of products, only certain products that you need to choose should go into that collection. You don't want things to be in there um, automatically, maybe just because of how your partnerships are set up, you can start a manual collection and you can add those products to that particular um, the collection on your store. Manual collections take more work to maintain, but can be a good choice for small or specialized collections. Like I mentioned, if you do something for charity or maybe you're doing something for back to school uh, that you can intend to curate personally. But for example, if you plan to hold a one-time flash sale or just a few products, then you can create a manual collection for them and set up a discount for just the products in their collection. So general co collections refer to the collections that are created for the navigation of your store and specific collections speak to things you may offer temporarily or provide a more specific type of product for. For example, a shoe that is meant for a certain weather only. Your collections will be used to create your store menu, and if done incorrectly, it can confuse the customer and create an off-user experience. 
And that's why we're spending a little more time on this because when you create collections, you can manipulate them in the navigation of your website. And if you, like I mentioned earlier, if you have a collection for all shoes and someone clicks the shoes and they have t-shirts mixed in everywhere, it's gonna confuse the experience of the customer. So you wanna make sure that those collections are set up correctly. Let's take a look at these collections as you see here. Her general collections such as loungewear and knitwear are detailed in her menu, but you see the sale in the feature collection can be uh, identified as specific. So um, if you see her feature collections are at the top, it's yours do not have to look like this. This is by me, all means, this is the, their own website. So you may not have a pop out uh, menu, but you can, or, or, and your menu doesn't have to look like this, but she has her collections, as you see, her sale, her, her um, categories are loungewear, knitwear, t-shirts, all of those are created as collections on the back end, probably with certain conditions, but uh, I'm sure t-shirts is just everything that relates to a t-shirt. So setting up your collections correctly will limit a, uh, use, limit the, a possible horrible um, user experience for customers. So unexpected shipping costs are the number one reason for cart abandonment, 56% guys. Items in a customer's cart at the time that they abandon the checkout are not saved. Abandoned checkout recovery is available only for the online store sales channel, the buy button sales channel, and the plus wholesale channel. Abandoned checkouts on Shopify point of sale or third party sales channel or third party sales channels will not receive a checkout recovery email. So if you are in a store, uh, you're having a pop up shop and someone decides that they're not going to purchase something while you're there, of course, they're not going to receive the email from it. But if they do purchase something, you'll have something in place to tell them thank you, but they won't receive an abandoned checkout at a point of sale um, on location or a third party sale. So if they check out on Facebook, they're not gonna receive a, a abandoned cart email from Shopify. You have to integrate something else. So uh, just remember that if you do integrate like a Facebook or Instagram and someone adds to cart there, you're not, they're not gonna be in your retention email, your abandoned cart email strategy. You're gonna have to put something else in place. When a customer gets to checkout and they see an unexpected fee, it leads to cart abandonment. Be sure to have an abandoned cart email strategy in place. When creating an abandoned cart strategy, the first thing to understand is that you 100% want to send multiple emails. I would recommend a minimum of one a day for five days. E-commerce customers who receive multiple abandoned shop shopping cart emails are 2.4 times more likely to complete the purchase than those who receive only one follow-up email. And customers who receive multiple abandoned cart emails have a multiple transaction rate 44% higher than those who didn't. So depending on what platform you're using to, to create your abandoned cart strategy, I highly suggest that you, um, make the, that, that process different for the customer. So you're gonna wanna make sure the header and the emails are changed, the picture, maybe they see something different um, in the abandoned cart email for the next couple of days. And another trend that I'm seeing as well uh, for uh, certain brands, and it, it doesn't work for all, but abandoned cart text messages. So if you do allow people to, uh, if you do have an option for people to leave their phone number, opting in when they first come into your website. Having an abandoned cart text message out there is also a way to communicate to your customers. So understanding the best way to ship your products to your customers is an important part of running your business. Before you take your first order, you need to decide what shipping methods you want to use and then set up your store shipping so that customers can choose a delivery method at checkout. Shopify shipping lets you connect your Shopify account with Shopify shipping carrier accounts, which has the following benefits. 
It displays calculated shipping rates instead of flat rates to your customers at checkout. You get reduced rates for your shipping labels and your print shipping labels direct from your Shopify admin. So thinking about your shipping, this is very important. You know, we've been having some issues with the mail every now and then. I am a huge fan to compete with Amazon or any of the big wholesalers out there, anyone right now, is to, when you're setting your, 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 your pricing for your products, include the shipping and offer free shipping, if you can. Everything can. If it's heavy item, I understand you can't get that. Um, but thinking about this offering free shipping or some type of reduced shipping rate to lead to emails or something that's going to benefit the return of the customer for your business, I highly recommend your uh, including a shipping strategy that's either free or reduced just because of the, the way the climate of e-commerce is going today. So these are a couple of helpful resources that you can uh, refer to um, after the webinar of some of the things we spoke about today, highlighting like this Shopify theme store at themes.shopify.com is where you can view the themes before you get started. If you want to review more about Shopify in general, I suggest visiting shopify.com, Compass, um, because the Compass platform can teach you so many things about actually building your Shopify store on your own. Um, and then, of course, the App Store. If you're budgeting for your store and you want to look at some of the different apps we discussed, like print on demand apps with Printful and Gelato, Printify, you can find those apps in the App Store. And you can also just see what other options are available there that you may want to integrate for your, for your store. I also suggest uh, when you start to build your store, you check out Shopify Burst, which is a uh, stock photo uh, platform that gives you different stocks, like stock photos like I spoke about earlier. You still have Adobe, some of them are the same, but Burst is a great free one you can use on Shopify. You can also, not all the pictures are free, let me say that. Burst is a free platform you can use. Some of the photos there are free for you to use, but they also have paid ones just like any other stock photo platform. And then if you need to create a logo, of course you can use Canva, Adobe are my suggestions, but you also have has have hatchful.shopify.com, which is a logo creator. Um, and these are some of the helpful resources and websites you can use, but also a uh, goal without a plan, I just wanna mention this, is just a wish. And I know I mentioned your the black hole on the call, but set your goal, make the plan, get to work. You have to stick to it, especially with e-commerce. You may not see your products converting immediately, but the, the key to it is get to work and stick to it. If you stick to it and, you do, and you're doing it correctly, you will reach the goal that you want to reach. I want to hear your story and see how your journey is going. So follow me on LinkedIn and um, tell me about you shopping, you starting your Shopify store, or if you have questions, you can message me and I'm happy to answer them. But I look forward to seeing everyone next time. And thank you so much for the warm welcome. We can now open the floor for some questions. I want to see what you guys um, are asking and we can also if you want to come off mute and ask your question live you can do that um, but how do you protect your intellectual property your designs when doing print on demand you're pro it depending on what you're what you're doing you're probably going to have to go a legal route I'm not an attorney, so putting it out there, I can't give you any legal advice. However, uh, you may, depending on your branding, want to look into trademarking. I personally like to tell people that it takes a lot for someone to steal your brand and steal your property, um, especially if they're going to be successful. Like if they are really taking it to the max and they clearly are making money off your brand, then yes. But it takes so much work to really build a successful business. I mean, it's less likely in the beginning that someone's gonna steal your brand. That doesn't mean look into it. That does not mean go a trademark work, trademark route, copywriting route, by all means, but it takes a lot. So get started and make some money and see where you go from there. 
Also, how do you deal with taxation using print on demand if you live in one state and your customers live in other states or even across the globe? Check with your local um, state laws and see what their tax uh, rules are for retail e-commerce businesses. In some states, you only pay for the transactions that are local for you. And if you don't add tax in your, if you're not charging the customer tax, depending on whatever the rules of your state have, you may have to pay taxes on your orders at the end of the year anyway. So just check with, and I'm pretty sure your advisors can work with you to find that information depending on where you're located, but you're going to have to look at that per state, depending on where you are. Normally, you're just charged the tax for the people that are located there, and they're charged the tax for where they are because across different states, you have different taxes. So in Illinois, where I'm at, taxes are more expensive than they are in Tennessee. So just thinking about where you're located. Any more questions? How many people have already started stores? Looking to start stores? Hi, Adrian. This is Pete. How are you? Hi, Pete. I'm great. <laughs> so, so a lot of good information passed along this. And of course, the um, me being an older guy, I'm just going to say I'm not into all this e-commerce and so on and so forth. But is there any type of should I say decision tree or anything as it relates to Shopify or a project plan, i.e. task list associated with this? You went through so much and it's like, you know what? I probably don't have the time for this. Mm -hmm. You went on to mention Shopify experts and I look at experts as experts or consultants or so on and so forth. And personally would love to engage with an expert slash consultant that probably is going to be paid as a consultant. And they have the knowledge to take what I want to do and build out a project plan with task. Then I can assign tasks outside of that based on the resources I have available to me. Yes, you can do that. I'm going to put my email in the chat. Um, however, there is, a to ask your original question, yes, there's a task list to get you started that's in the Shopify blog. Shopify, the marketing blog, they write about starting your Shopify store all the time and include those resources in there. But not only Shopify, Pete, you can also research other platforms that are not Shopify per se, but integrations that you will use that tell you more about, shop, about e-commerce stores like HubSpot, which I'm putting in the chat right now. It's a great blog. I read HubSpot every day just because it's, it's a marketing platform. It's uh, It tells you exactly what you need to do your store. And then if you want to work with a consultant or someone that can build your site out for you and then you tell you on the back end what you need to do on a daily basis to operate it, I would suggest using the Shopify expert platform inside of Shopify. But if you are a little experienced or if you work with your advisor or myself and you wanna use Fiverr or Upwork to find someone else, um, I can give you information on what to look for when hiring someone to do that. The Shopify compass, let me put that in here. I suggest you also research because it's going to tell you what to do step by step as well. Give you ideas. Oh, let me put this in here too. Um, oh, what is it here? I'm thinking of another one that's really great uh, that Google does for businesses. It's um, but but and I understand everything you're saying. And mine is speed to market. Okay, so I know what I want to do, and what I don't want to do is keep revisiting it or whatever. I want a person that can maybe has lived it or is familiar with all the products and how everything integrates. So I don't make a mistake and have to go back. I have the mm -hmm. people to produce images. I have the people to produce whatever, but I just, I don't have the time, honestly, to orchestrate it. And I'm sure I, I've managed projects. That's what I've done for my life. And, mm -hmm. and you know, so you have experts that do certain things to get to that goal quickly. And the last thing you want to do is to come back and revisit it or say, oh, 
I messed up when I built the foundation. The foundation is key. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, so I'm more apt to say, give me a person that, uh, or an expert that knows how to do custom t-shirts. So does it go, does it go, artist creates image. Then in, do I bring in Kin Custom? Well, Kin Custom is okay for sneakers versus t-shirts. Well, does this expert by chance know a good t-shirt company that's not from another country and the different size shirts come into play in the U.S. market? You know, it's kind of, um, maybe I'm talking too much, but no, that's no, no, what no. I'm looking for. Well, when you, let's talk offline, but when you, um, I put my email address in here. I'm going to say that's going to be one of the platforms that I think you can find someone like that to be very specific about your contract that you look, what you're looking for is going to be Upwork, then it would be Fiverr, because mm -hmm. Fiverr allows you to get, um, it's, it's like I'm offering my services, what I do is very clicky cutter, whereas Upwork, you can actually describe what your business is, what you need that person to do, and if they want to and if they can do what you're doing, they'll submit a submit a proposal to you to do the contract. Mm -hmm. Shopify expert platform is going to build the website platform for you. Great. They're going to build it correctly. They may not have had experience in the particular industry that you're looking to work in to meet all of those demands that you need in order not to go back. So it may be a two-fold partnership where you may have to bring certain things to the table, but you can have a contractor that brings in another component to lessen the work for yourself. Right, and that's, yeah, the project plan or the task list. And I can say, okay, this is on me to find that third-party vendor to integrate and what has been done successfully with Shopify because I don't wanna go if I'm going to say Shopify is it and already go develop on my own with another vendor and then all of a sudden they don't talk nice. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm, absolutely. Let's talk about it, though. If you need help on deciding where to go or how to do that, we can talk about it for sure. Perfect. Um, Thank you. Thank you for your time. No problem. Thank you for coming. Will I need my LLC before starting my online store? Yes, you will. Yes, you're going to need an LLC before starting a business. Um, well, it doesn't have to be an LLC. It can be a sole proprietorship, uh, whatever. It's not going to ask you that. It is going to ask you about your bank account, what information you want to go. So you will have to have an established business in order to use a Shopify platform in order to, you know, receive payment. But like I said, if you're a freelancer, you may be a sole proprietor. Um, you may be an S corp. I suggest working with your advisor, decide what particular business entity works best for your business and then go from there. But you will need a bank account and I suggest it be related to your business in order to start your Shopify store. Any more questions about starting your business? I know we went over a little bit today, but. Okay, we'll this is Pete again. I'm just going to ask you. Oh, no problem. Who and what is an advisor? Is that an advisor within Shopify or is that? That's your consultant through the SPDC. So if you're not registered, Tammy uh, can help you with okay. getting registered with a counselor at the SBDC. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, Thank absolutely. Uh, Adrian is spot on. I know not a lot of people are asking business related questions that are not so much uh, pertaining to the e commerce side that Adrian is uh, speaking about. Those questions are perfect for your TSBDC counselor or advisor. And if you're not currently signed up with us and working with someone, go to our website, tsbdc.org, and sign up. And that'll put you in touch one-on-one -on -one with a small business expert. And they can answer those questions and get you with the right people who can get these things set up and, and done for you. So like, especially a question like, do I need to start my LLC or, or sole proprietorship before joining Shopify? That's, that's definitely a, a person or a business that would benefit from working one-on-one -on -one with a TSBDC counselor. So definitely do that step. 